Hi. Um, so if you have any questions, uh, please ask me them on Twitter, uh, because I don't think there's going to be much time at the, at the end. Um, so my name is Paul Verbeek. And I'm a front-end web developer at a company called NetFleece Internet Deezer. Um, so just a quick trivia after lunch. Does anybody know what that little red dot is? What country that is? Yeah, it is the Netherlands. So it's about a seventh of the size of Oregon, um, which is pretty small then. So that's where I'm from. And yesterday uh, I was sitting at Starbucks when someone asked me where I was from, so I told him. And he said, oh yeah, that's the capital of Denmark, right? <laughs> no. So before I became a presentation, I want to clarify some things about the Netherlands. So first of all, this is the Netherlands, and as you can see, it's not the capital of Denmark. And also, the Netherlands is not the same thing as Amsterdam. <laughs> and we don't all live in Amsterdam, it's just our capital. Um, and it's not the same thing as Holland. These two provinces, they're North and South Holland, and they make up Holland. It's just like saying that the US is the same thing as Dakota. So. So, and I live and work at that red dot in Breda, which is not Amsterdam or in Holland. Oh. Oh, and there's one thing before I start my presentation. Um, it's not going to be about jQuery at all. And it's not going to be about automated testing. Uh, this presentation is going to be about why you should test on different devices and how you can do that without going crazy on all the possibilities. So. We all test our websites and apps as good and as thoroughly as possible on as many devices, right? <laughs> yeah, didn't think so. <laughs> but we want to test our websites and apps as good and as thoroughly as possible. It's just a matter of resources. Um, if we had more time and devices to test on, we would. Right? No. But we want to want to test our websites and apps as good as possible. So um, we don't like testing, and even if we had the resources, we'd probably be doing something else, something cooler. And even adding more features to our already untested website is usually a lot more fulfilling than to actually test the thing. Now, in our experience, testing is uh, extremely repetitive, and innovation is nowhere to be found. Um, so why would you waste your time on something like that? And I'm not saying that you should, but I'll get to that a bit later. So we know testing is important. Um, we've all experienced the counts of issues that were returned after a project was supposed to be finished. And we know that we could have avoided most of them if we just tested a bit more during the project. Uh, we know it's important, but it's a bit like brushing your teeth. Well, let me clarify on that. Uh, when I was a kid, I knew brushing my teeth was important. No, actually I didn't, but I knew that, brushing my uh, that if I didn't brush my teeth, my parents would get mad. Um, but because it was so boring and I could get away with it sometimes, I didn't brush my teeth. When I was a bit older, somewhere around my teens, uh, I thought I knew how important it was. Uh, because I learned that if I didn't brush, I would get cavities and I would regret it. So I brushed my teeth once a week because I thought that would be enough to avoid most of the problems. So now that I've grown up, uh, I'm, more, I'm older and have more experience. And I know that even if it's dull, I always brush my teeth at least twice a day. So even tonight, after the partying and the beer, I hope someone will get me to my room, and I will go to the bathroom and will brush my teeth before going to bed, even if that means I'll fall asleep on the bathroom floor. <laughs> so I know that I'll remain my good teeth even though it's boring. And this is how testing works for a developer as well. Not the last part about the sleeping on the bathroom floor, but the rest. So when you're a beginning developer, you know that testing is important. But it's only because your superiors tell you it is. You find it boring and tedious. And you believe so much in your own skill that you don't think you could have made any errors. So you try to escape it most of the times and only test when you're caught. So later you know it's important. But that's only because you've experienced the pitfalls. And you've seen the bug lists that are returned and possibly even see projects failing because of the lack of testing but you still only test when you think it's necessary. And that's not a lot, because you have better things to do, like partying. So 
then when you're more experienced, you know you should always test. You know how long it takes, and you know that it's the boring but necessary part of your job. Um, you don't like it, but even after a long and hard feature implementation, you will drink your Red Bull or coffee and uh, test your product. Um, even if that means you fall asleep on your keyboard and wake up next morning with some sort of Azure drawing on your face. No. This should, this should change. Testing should not be the boring thing you do when you're a worn-out programmer. Um, it should be a good part of your work, and people should do them in, uh, from the beginning. First of all, because testing is a lot different than uh, how it was just a few years ago. So to really see how much is changed in just the past few years, we need to take a step back and see how much it was all the, the same all those years before. So here's a short, very short history um, on the mobile internet. According to Wikipedia, I'm some of my better guesswork. So in the autumn of 69, uh, ARPANET, the first packet switcher, was tested. In their first test, the computer crashed before it could even write log. Now, the autumn of 69 probably wouldn't have been a good song, but it was the first step towards the internet. OK, does anyone know what this is? Nobody? Yeah, it's an original World Wide Web logo. So it might surprise you, but this is not made by a designer. <laughs> I always think it looked like some sort of superhero logo. Oh. So, um, where was I? Uh, yeah, more than 20 years later, um, somewhere around 1991, the World Wide Web was created. And with it, the first web browser, the first web server, and the first web page. And around 1993, the web was growing, and largely thanks to the Mosaic browser, which is generally known as the first real graphical browser. So back then, you only had one browser to test on. Well, not really, because you had a few non-graphical browsers, but they didn't really matter anymore because Mosaic was graphical. So you really had one browser to care about. Now, this was 20 years ago. And in time, a lot of browsers came, and some of them went after, all, after a while. And a few stayed for a very long time before they died out. And some, like IE or Oprah, exist for almost 20 years now. Um, and even though the browsers changed, one thing stayed pretty much the same. The number of devices. Um, you had a PC or you had a Mac. And, okay, the screen resolutions differed a bit, but they were roughly all the same. And even performance was mostly equal. Well, for some of the, us, that changed as early as 1996. I think that's actual size on this screen. <laughs> so, in 1996, Nokia came with the N9000 communicator. Um, it was the first mobile device with internet capabilities. Uh, you could browse on it, but I don't think any website worked on it. But for most of us, it changed about five years ago, when the iPhone became popular and Android was released. Um, it was not until then that the mobile website became really important. So now more and more devices are coming, and not only mobile phones or tablets. Uh, let's not forget smart TVs are really emerging. And then there are even rumors that Apple will launch a smart watch later this year, or next year, or some, sometime around that. Uh, all those devices have their own operating systems, their own browsers, and their own hardware capabilities. So testing on those devices is as important as testing on the different browsers. But make sure to pick your battles, because even if a device has a browser, it doesn't mean you should be testing your website on it. Just because people are putting browsers on everything that has an internet connection, like this printer, um, it doesn't mean it's going to be used on a regular basis. So back from the start of the web, more than 20 years ago, till about five years ago, the devices to test them pretty much remained the same. Uh, you, do, you didn't really have to think about anything but a PC. And as you can see, th this has changed fast. Uh, and it's still changing. We don't know what will come in 10 years or so. We don't even know what's going to be popular in a year. But before we're trying to look into the future, let's just focus on what devices we have now and know that it's important to test on them. But you already know that it's important. Why else would you be here? Um, you care about quality. If not you, who else will? But convincing your boss, your client, or your project manager that testing is important, that's the tricky part. But you need the time to test, and they can give it to you. Um, make them realize the importance of testing, especially the client doesn't always know the downsides when testing is neglected. So you should ask them the right questions. Uh, ask them if, you're, if they ever use a phone or tablet to go online, and if they ever get annoyed by it. 
Ask them if they buy something online and what their experiences are. You can also show them uh, real life problems. Why not show them websites of competitors? Um, but if you also show them the ones who do it wrong, they won't fall, won't fall on the same mistakes. And if you show them the ones who do it right, where a website works on a television or a game console, um, and you can explain them that the biggest difference uh, of the site is the amount of testing, they will realize they are losing money if they don't invest in it. So voice your opinion, but be prepared for letdowns. When you ask them for extra, extra testing time the first time, you won't probably get much, or even any time at all. Uh, so if you work at a, in a company where testing is none of one, not one of the key points, make sure you keep letting them know that you care. Uh, whenever you can point them out uh, to uh, them on problems that would have been avoided when you would test a bit more, um, don't be afraid that I told you so, to tell them that. Sorry. Um, and if you get to a point where you get the extra time to test on more devices, make sure you get a lot. At first, uh, testing would take a lot of time. In my experience, it would be at about 15 to 20 percent of total development time. Well, this will become less if you're more experienced, but getting to know the basic issues of devices takes a lot of time in the beginning. And you should remember one important thing, uh, something most of us tend to forget. The most important person is not your boss or the client or you, it's, it's the customer. That one customer that comes to your website or uses your app and who doesn't have an expensive smartphone, but maybe a feature phone, um, and he wants to find your contact information, so he can give you a big sack of money. Think of him while you're testing. And there are a lot of devices to test on. There are easily hundreds of devices you could possibly test on. It's hard to imagine nowadays how different they are, are especially now they all look like a very small TV. So I'll try to give you a small feeling about the current spread of smartphones. And only smartphones or else you'll be sitting here for a few more hours. So uh, at the top we have the mobile browsers. Uh, Firefox, Chrome, Safari, Opera, IE, and Blackberry. Um, there are a lot more like the Android browser or Dolphin. But let's just focus on these six and skip all the versions as well, because six browsers is already likely more than you test on your, web, on your desktop. But it doesn't stop with the browsers, because each browser behaves differently on each operating system. It's essentially a different browser. Um, so for the operating system, we have Android, iOS, Windows Phone, and BlackBerry. Um, of course, again, there are others like Firefox OS or Symbian. Um, but let's just focus on this small but very important part again. So putting them together, you get a bit like this. Um, on the Android phone, you have Firefox, Chrome, and Opera Mobile and Opera Mini. Um, on iOS, you have Safari and Opera Mini and Chrome. Uh, IE has Internet Explorer and I think a few smaller browsers, like UC Browser. And BlackBerry, again, has the BlackBerry browser and Opera Mini. Well, these are a lot of browsers to test on already, but... Um, Oh yeah, I know I said I won't get into versions, but as Dave said in the keynote, um, Android 2.x still has a large user share. Um, the Android browser is slow and has bad support for new features and has a, lo a lot of bugs, so it's basically our new IE6. Um, but for now, we'll focus on just the latest version of each operating system, just to make it a bit more easier. Um, yeah, like I said before, every device has its own capabilities. Now, I'm not going to list every device, but I'll group them in the more important vendors. Uh, iOS and BlackBerry, they make their own devices, so let's put them away. Um, Windows 8 phones are currently built by uh, Nokia, Huawei, HTC, and Samsung. Samsung. Um, and Android 4 phones are built by far more vendors, but the largest are uh, HTC, LG, Sony, and Samsung. And again, these are only the largest manufacturer of the devices for these operating systems. Uh, every manufacturer then creates its own devices with their own hardware, uh, which basically means that every browser beha behaves a bit different on each uh, device. So putting all this together, uh, you get a bit something like this. Now, as you can see, there is a lot to test on. And this is a very small part, because we don't take the different device capabilities like screen size or process speed in account. 
And these are only for smartphones, uh, not even tablets or game consoles. And if you're building apps, you could just leave out the browser part, but you still wind up with a lot of devices to test on. So if you want to know how your website or app will work on all those devices, you should test a lot. Um, but testing on all those devices is easier said than done. It's pretty much impossible. You can't have all the devices lying around somewhere on your desk, testing every small thing, you know, every small change you make. You'll need a very big bank to buy all these devices, and even testing a textual change could then take several hours, if not days. So you need some sort of workflow, a way to manage your uh, testing without going insane with all the different options. So first of all, um, make a list of phones, tablets, or other devices you wanted to work on. Don't think about the budget or if it's as all, at all possible to test on them. Uh, think about your user base. What do they use? So your list could be made based on statistics or device types or resolutions, maybe even age. Just don't make the list too long because you don't want to spend too much time on it. But make sure you set a goal. You can't go blindly testing everything you can get your hands on. Um, it takes time and you're bound to forget some important ones. So if you're making a website, you should check the analytics of your current website, um, if that's available. And otherwise, you could just try a wide variety of devices. But if you're making an app, make sure you test on different screen sizes. And don't forget the slow devices. I have a slow device myself, and I find it very frustrating to play a game like Temple Run that keeps lagging and causes my character to die. Or when I use a to-do list that takes a second before I can add a new item. So make sure your list is relevant and diverse. Um, you should then find a starting point, a point where you most easily test on. Well, this is pretty easy. It's also your natural developing environment. Um, but it's also something you should take a moment and think about. Because at your starting point, you should be able to develop quick, but also test a lot of features. Uh, as a web developer, for me, of course, it's a browser. Um, Google Chrome is what I use to develop and test directly. And I can resize the browser, check the responsive breakpoints. Um, I can test my JavaScript fallbacks for the stuff I know will break somewhere. So as, a as web developers, we all do that. And don't change that. Um, well, after that, you want to emulate devices. So for quick testing, I use device emulators. They don't give the most accurate results, but if it works on them, you're getting somewhere. Well, managing all those emulators for all the devices you want to test on is nearly impossible. For iOS emulators, you even need a Mac, which is not my default working environment. But browser stacks help me out. With browser stack, you can access uh, browsers and emulators in a virtual machine through your browser. This sounds a bit difficult, but how it works is you sim simply click on, for example, the Motorola Razr, and the screen will come up, come up with an emulator for the Razer. So, the browser stack currently has about 40 different mobile phone and tablet emulators. Uh, it's a paid service, but it has a free trial. And if you don't like it, you can download and maintain your own emulators. But as I said, emulators aren't accurate. They simulate the software and part of the browser, uh, part of the hardware, sorry. Uh, you can test everything and performance testing is off. But it's still a good start. So now you want to test on real devices. There's nothing like uh, holding the device in your own hands, finding out how crisp your text is on the screen or how good the touch react, and if your buttons aren't too small for your fingers. Um, you've probably already tested on your own device and your colleagues, but that's not enough. L let me try something. Uh, who here has or can test on an Android phone? Show your hands. OK. Um, keep the hands up. Ah, thank you. Who of you can also test on an uh, iPhone? Or the ones who can also test on Android, Android and iPhone. OK. And who of you can also test on a BlackBerry? Over there. <laughs> and can you test on a Smart TV as well? A smart TV? No. So 
Um, okay. So as you can see, uh, you can test on everything by yourself. Even this whole room, there isn't one person that can test on everything. Um, so here's where open device labs come in. How many have you, of you have heard of an open device lab? Okay. Um, did you actually visit one as well? No. Okay, for those who don't know what they are, uh, open device labs or ODLs are locations where everybody can come and test on a range of devices. So they're mostly maintained by internet agencies, but they are free to use. So to understand how these ODLs work, um, I'll tell you for a bit of their short history. Um, a little bit more than a year ago, a company right here, uh, Mobile Portland, came up with the idea to open a place where everybody could come and test their websites and apps on the devices they had lying around. Um, Jeremy Keith in the UK thought it was a great idea and created a, a device lab as his, at his own company. And then he wrote a blog post about it, explaining how he established it. And with his attitude to ignore the extra security and insurance, he could open up a device lab real quick. He just had a table with his devices on it and told everybody they could, could come. Um, a lot of people were excited and even started donating their old devices to the device lab. And inspired by this, more and more device labs were opening up all around the world. Now, today there are over 50 uh, device labs across 20 countries with a total of more than 800 devices for you to test on. Now, if you want to find one, make sure you check out opendevicelab.com. Uh, it's a collection of all the ODLs, so you can easily find the one you need for your project. Uh, open Device Lab also shows if people found the device lab open and what they thought of it. And you can also find the device lab's address, web, uh, website, and social media pages. But besides the device, the device to test on, uh, Open Device Lab got all your testing needs covered. Um, like the Wi-Fi, it's pretty hard to have a lot of devices connecting uh, on the same Wi-Fi as, at the same time. And they found their solution, so you don't have to think about it. And another thing is a good testing location. Having the right space at your own company is hard to maintain. Um, but the devices really have, uh, device labs really have creative solutions. Uh, some of them make device walls out of Lego, and others build professional-looking stands out of wood. But they all have the room for you to test, uh, to test on. Uh, and testing tools are also very useful. And some device labs also have those pre-installed on, on their devices and a laptop. Uh, tools like Ghost Lab or Adobe Edge Inspect, uh, they take everything you do on one browser and mimics it on the devices that are connected with it. So whether you enter a URL or click on the link, it will happen simultaneously on all devices. And this obviously saves a lot of time. But there are also other uh, tools which some device labs use. And if you want to know what they have to help you, uh, you can visit their website or just email them. Um, but because Open Device Labs are built by the community and for the community, it's very important that users give a little back. Um, doing this is rather simple. Most people have old devices at home. And if you do and don't need them anymore, consider donating them. And anything helps, like a Nintendo DS or an old feature phone. As long as it works and has an internet connection, uh, Device Labs can find something to, to do with it. But if you want to do something bigger, you can also establish your own device lab. Um, there are just a few things you need. At the start, you don't need a very, uh, not a very good Wi-Fi or a lot of devices. That will come later. If you're just setting things up, any working Wi-Fi will do fine, just as long as your devices can go online. And you also need a testing space. Nothing too fancy, just a simple table will do. And you need the devices. You won't need to pay a lot of money uh, to buy a few, a few dozen devices. And with the Wi-Fi and, and the table, you can start very basic. If you work at a company, maybe your colleagues can help with a few devices they don't use. Uh, you can promise your colleagues that they will, can get their devices back if their current device will break. That will help with a couple of donations. Um, so what kind of devices you want to start with? Well, these are the same devices you want, uh, probably want to uh, test on for yourself as well. 
Uh, there are numerous of options, but you want the devices to cover most of the basics, and you don't want to spend a lot of money on it. So, first of all, you want an iPhone. Well, that's one, that one's not very cheap, but chances are you, have, you already have one. Um, at our device lab, we don't have an iPhone, but because there's nearly uh, always someone around that has one, so as long as you can test on it, you, can, uh, you really don't ha have to have one in your own lab. I see this is a bit outdated. You want one with iOS 7 now, I think. So um, then you want a recent Android device. Uh, new, you can get one around 100 to 150 dollars. But if you buy one in a second-hand store or online, you can get below 100. Um, but as I said before, you'll still need an older Android device. They're often used and a lot different from the 4.x version. Now, with these three devices, you'll cover most of your smartphone users. And I think this, these three are the most important ones for you to test on as well. But some projects need, need a little bit more. Um, so it's also uh, good to have a feature phone in your lab as well. And they are also easy to come by because a lot of people have these lying around as backup phones. And they're also a lot cheaper to buy. Uh, brand new Nokia Asia. I don't know how much it costs here, but in the Netherlands it's about 50 euros. Um, you also want uh, to look at smaller screens. Uh, a widescreen phone, uh, like older Blackberries. Uh, the screen size is so different, you're bound to find something that you didn't expect. And the user base is a lot larger than you think. Uh, while you're at this, you can, if you find one phone like that, you should also try to find one that has a, doesn't have touch as well. Interactions with phones without touch are a lot harder. So you might have noticed that I skipped the iPad at the bottom th about top three, because iPads are really expensive. Uh, the cheapest one in the Netherlands is about 400 euros. I think it's 400 dollars here. So um, it's used almost as much as the iPhone, but for, the, for that price you have to make the decision if you'd rather buy more phones. So with this small list, you have a very useful lab already. Um, but even if you own just a couple of phones, maybe two or three, you can open up your lab for the public anyway. If people are interested, they will come and maybe even donate something to help you get going. And if you're establishing an ODL, make sure you join LabUp. Uh, this is a nonprofit organization, especially uh, for helping open device labs. They can help you with all sorts of questions. And they can get you in touch with device manufacturers and other open device lab managers. But if there aren't any device labs nearby, uh, it could take a lot of time to go to one. And maybe you don't have the resources or time to establish your own lab. Well, luckily, there are other ways to test on real devices. Uh, you can go to nearby telephone stores. They have a lot of devices lying around for you to test on. Um, and the employees aren't going to be asking you a lot of questions, as long as you don't take a lot of time. Um, for one project, we wanted to see uh, the image qualities on diff uh, many different screens. Uh, so even our device lab wasn't enough. So we went to the city center and walked into different phone stores and an Apple reseller. Um, in less than an hour, we tested on more than 40 tablets, smartphones, and smart TVs, and nobody even tried to sell something. Um, another way to test is in remote device labs, like these from Nokia and Samsung. Uh, they look like a collection of emulators, but in fact, they are devices you can remotely control through, through your browser. It basically streams uh, the screen from a real device to your browser, and you can interact with them like you would do with an emulator. So you just select the device and wait for a few seconds for it to come available. Um, the only thing you can do is hold it, but it's far better than an emulator. And where Nokia and Samsung have their own device to test on, Device Anywhere by Keynote has a lot of different choices. Um, device Anywhere offers a free version and a paid version. The free version offers a smaller selection of devices and has a limit of 10 minutes per session, but the, the sessions uh, themselves are unlimited. And with the paid version, you can also test your own apps with sessions of up to three hours. But all this testing doesn't really make your job more fun. As I said in the beginning, it's repetitive and you'd rather be doing something else, something cooler. Um, to explain a bit how I make my testing more fun, 
um, I'll try with I try I'll, I'll try with a few quotes from Dr. Seuss. Well, where I come from, Dr. Seuss isn't really big, but I like his stories anyway. I like nonsense; it wakes up the brain cells. Well, this is really true. Um, if you're all, always working and not giving your uh, head some time to relax, you're not getting anywhere fast, and it doesn't make your work more fun. And this goes as well for device testing. Remember that you're using fantastic devices. And try to play around with them a bit. Download some apps or games and visit your favorite website. You got a feeling for the device. It helps you clear your mind, but it also makes you feel like a user of the device. Um, if you then test your website or app, you know how you would use the device and what's annoying. From there to here, from here to there, funny things are everywhere. Well, some problems are just straight up weird. And weird problems are fun. Make sure you laugh when you come across them. Don't think how hard it is going to fix it, because you'll probably fix it faster than you expect. Just smile when you think about how this happened, and share it. This is a very fun one. It took me about four hours to find what was happening here. It was just a small CSS thing that makes everything semi-transparent. So, people will leverage your problems. And not only that, people will want to know uh, your problems and how you've dealt with it. Uh, if it's something small, you can tweet it or do some other, other social media stuff. And if it's bigger, why not write a blog post about it? And if you're not sure how to fix it, those same people will try to help you. So it all began with a shoe on the wall. A shoe on the wall shouldn't be there at all. Well, people use devices in strange ways, just like shoes. Think of them when you're testing. Um, is your site readable when someone is running or cycling? Well, why don't you try it out? Uh, try to get yourself in situations where you think your user is going to end up in and take it a step further. Of course, not this far. But um, if you're not alone in your work like them, try to compete with each other to think, about, uh, to think of the most obscure but realistic situations. And you can also watch your users. You don't always need an expensive user research group. For example, if you're making a shopping list app, go to a supermarket and watch people interact and find out uh, how to use their current shopping list. And everything stinks till it's finished. Yeah, um, look at your product on that device and think about what it can become. Challenge yourself because you know you can make it better and you, can, you know you can make it more intuitive. Um, if your product is not finished, it will be crap to some of your potential users. And there are a lot of ways to make things fun. Uh, I can only give you some ideas, but you should test on the things that are fun to you and what drives you as a developer and try to incorporate that into testing. Because as a developer, you are creative and I'm sure you can think of something. Um, a lot of people find repetitive tasks fun if you can make them think as fun. As many developers, I'm also a gamer and the games I play have trophies or achievements for doing the most repetitive tasks. And with role-playing games, you even, you'll need to grind or repetitively kill monsters to level up. And that could take about two hours to even go up one level. So the reward, no matter how little, at the end of a goal, makes repetitive tasks more fun. So make sure you set a goal and reward yourself. I'm even, even making an achievements list for myself. And in it, I'm adding various tasks, like from very easy, like making work in the latest Google Chrome to hard tasks like adding gestures and tests on the Kinect. I'll post it on GitHub when it's ready, so if you like it, please con contribute to it. Um, so in short, for me, uh, making testing fun is to share my pain and my glory and finding uh, challenges in the devices, uh, playing around with them, but also make other people more enthusiastic about testing. But you should try to find your own way to make it fun. And before you make it fun, make it easier for yourself. Make sure you have a testing workflow and know on what devices you are going to test and how you're going to test on them. And don't forget Open Device Labs. They can help you with it. And always think about the user when you're trying to convince your boss or your client that they are the most, pro uh, they are the most important people on your product, for your product. So testing is important. And make sure you know that yourself before you're trying to convince anybody else. So my advice. I actually made it last, last night, and it doesn't look very good. 
So my advice and what I'm trying to give to you is that testing doesn't have to be boring. And even if, it's some, uh, even if it sometimes seems like an army of phones or, and tablets all wanting your attention, make sure you know which ones deserve yours. It shouldn't be hard if you have the right tools and find the help you need. Because even World Wide Webman can do it alone. So thank you. And are there any questions? Because if there are. <laughs> Questions? Questions? Nope, everyone understands more. <laughs> I don't know if actually on the Yeah. Um, so, what, do you have any suggestions for um, debugging? Uh, in particular, like, we tend to have problems with specific uh, browsers on specific devices, uh, Samsung Galaxy. Um, 3GS is one of the worst. Um, do you, uh, we've used Inspect to debug, but that's very specific to the browser. So um, do you have any suggestions or tools for debugging? Um, yeah, there are a lot of different tools. Um, but there are no tools as for all the devices, as you said. Um, a winery that uh, works on a lot of Devices. Uh, it's a remote. Uh, let's see. Oh, you can't see anything. Uh, yeah. Well, Winery is something that works great. It's W A I R N E. Let's see if I can get this. No. Winery. Yeah, there it is. As I said. Um, Mecca is not, per, is not really my thing I work with, winery. Yeah, it's a remote web inspector, and it works on a lot of phones. Uh, I don't know which phones specifically, but you can check that out. And I think there are not a lot of other tools, but um, yeah, I don't really use very much debugging tools. Are there any other questions? All right. Woohoo. Thank you. <laughs>